do carpeting and flooring. Really nice. New carpet smell hits your seizure. Yeah. Right oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I was in seminary. I did a summer internship in Leesburg, Florida in a church and they had a community and they had a they had a coffee house and we broadcast it on the local radio station but the, they had carpeting in there and if you if the air conditioning wasn't running you could not stay in the building it was so strong the carpet not the draperies I'm talking about the draperies and the, the windows I, it it just you couldn't stand it. You had to go turn the air conditioning before you could go and stay in there. And and, and it had been it had been, it had been been built for a couple of years. It still smell. Oh, and it, oh, it was terrible. My eyes would water, and uh, so I always had the first thing I had to do was go get the air conditioning. Yeah. Air conditioning.
Good morning, everyone. We want to welcome you this morning to St. Matthew's United Methodist Church. My name is Adam. I'm one of the pastors on staff. Whether you're worshiping with us here in person in the sanctuary or watching with us online, we are so excited to have you with us this morning. If you are a guest with us, we want to say a special word of welcome to you. Thank you, especially for being here at the end of this morning's service. If you go out the back sanctuary doors and to the left, there's a welcome table there. We would love to greet you and thank you for being with us. If you are on Facebook, even if you're here in person, we would love to take the opportunity to ask you uh, to share this worship service on your Facebook page as a way of inviting your friends and family to join in worship with us. Inside your worship guide, there are a few quick announcements that we want to lift up before we get started. Uh, first off, we do have Wednesday Night Live again this week. We're doing that every Wednesday night. Uh, the meal this week is fried chicken, mashed potatoes, and green beans, so we'd love to have you come out and join us for dinner. Two of our small groups are already up and running, the God Unbound Galatian Study and Financial Peace University. But then this week, a third small group kicks off, Introduction to Jesus, the Gospel of Mark. Uh, the sign-up sheet for that is up on the welcome desk in the upper colonnade. Uh, but it's not too late to join in any of the three of those small groups. The next one that's there is a ministry of St. Matthew's area ministry called Super Bowl of Caring. Uh, this is a way to be a blessing uh, toward the problem of hunger in our community. And so if you would be interested in participating in that uh, fundraiser, uh, you can see the information and contact info there. Last but not least, inside your worship guide, you'll find two pieces of information about uh, the Methodist Children's Home and our fifth Sunday offering. The first insert gives you just a little bit of information about the ministry of the Children's Home. We'll watch a video during our offering time as well so that you can see what they've been doing. And then you see there the giving envelope that also has information there about how you can donate online. Uh, so we'll talk about that more during our offering time. Those are all the announcements I have this morning. We're so excited to have our jubilation bells with us this morning. Let's prepare our hearts for worship with our opening prelude.
Please stand for the call to worship. Holy One, dwell within us. Whisper in our ears. Glimmer in our vision. Write upon our hearts. We wait. With open ears, open eyes, open hearts. Amen.
please remain standing and join me in our affirmation of faith, the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. seated. so excited this morning to be in the newly renovated sanctuary. If you did not notice as you came in, this is not the same flooring that you left a couple of weeks ago. We're so excited to have the new carpet and the new vinyl installed. I'm sure that many, many years ago, uh, there was a dedication of our sanctuary. So we're not saying this morning we're dedicating it for the first time, but we do during our prayer time this morning want to rededicate our sanctuary to the worship of God and celebrate this new renovation and new step in the life and ministries of our church. Before we do that, though, we want to recognize uh, the many, many folks who helped make uh, this renovation possible. Uh, so first, I would like to invite any of our trustees here at St. Matthew's Methodist to stand. If you were on our trustees committee even last year, maybe you rolled off at the beginning of the year, but you had a huge part in this. Any of our trustees here, we'd like to invite you to stand and remain standing. Um, anyone who helped move pews, there was a whole crew of folks who helped carry pews. I heard someone say when they walked in this morning and saw the pews, their back immediately hurt. It was like PTSD uh, from that. Um, any of you who helped actually with the flooring or the brackets or the screwing down of the pews, or I even saw people uh, going around on their hands and knees painting screw heads to make sure they match the bracket, or maybe you helped clean or shampoo pew pads. Basically at this point, if you had any role whatsoever uh, in the renovation, we would like for you to stand. And let's give these folks a huge round of applause for their help. There in your worship guide is a prayer of dedication. You have a response that is there in bold, and at the end, we will pray the Lord's Prayer together to close that prayer time. But let's pray this prayer of rededication today. Eternal God, by the power of your Holy Spirit, consecrate this house of your worship. Bless us and sanctify what we do here, that this place may be holy for us and a house of prayer for all people. To your glory, to the honor of Jesus Christ, and to the praise of the Holy Spirit, we, the people of this congregation, rededicate this building and ourselves 
anew to the worship and service of Almighty God through Jesus Christ our Lord. And now we join our hearts together to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Like we said for our offering time this morning, we want to give you the normal reminders that you can give here in person as our ushers come around, or you can also go on our website, stmatthewsmethodist.com, and see all the options for giving that you see there on the screen. But this is also a special Sunday, a fifth Sunday, where in the life of our church, we dedicate a part of our offering to the ministry of the Methodist Children's Home. And so we wanted you to see just a short video about the difference that your donations are making in the lives of kids in our state. So let's watch this together. Hi, I'm Amanda, a case manager for the Kentucky United Methodist Children's Home. I want to say thank you for supporting us with your donations. Did you know we were able to serve over 700 youth and families with community-based services last year? I'm standing here in my resource pantry full of items that you have either given or funded with your donations. These items help fill the gaps for what families need. There are a lot of families struggling right now, physically, mentally, or financially because of inflation or the pandemic. So I'm basically their helper. I can help fill their gaps from my pantry and help get them connected with the care that they need, um, whether that's a therapist on our team, education support, a healthcare provider, or job skills training. Food insecurity is one of the biggest needs for families right now. One family I recently served was struggling with having enough food to feed everyone, and mom had just lost her job. Because of the food pantry, I was able to help them. I was able to deliver non-perishables as well as some milk and some meat to help them through the tough time. Now the family is doing much better. I worked with and encouraged mom to apply as a server at a new restaurant here in town. She got the job and is really thriving. They, uh, they tell me that they're really grateful for the extra support that they received from the, um, from the food pantry. It is only because of your support that this is possible. So thank you for giving. Could you all hear that better than I could on the stage? Um, insert whatever inspiring message you would want to hear uh, from the Methodist Children's Home that, that would move you to give uh, this morning. We are so proud of the ministry of the Children's Home. Uh, we want to invite our ushers to come forward at this time, and we'll continue to worship by giving of our tithes and our offerings. I'm going to ask for your help on our offertory this morning. Would you turn to page 452, hymn number 452, and we're going to ask you to participate with us this morning. We're going to do, my faith looks up to thee, and we need your input on this. Verses 1, 2, and, th and 4. 1, 2, and 4. We're going to omit, omit number 3. Okay, so 1, 2, and 4. And you're going to sing with the bells in this ensemble in front. Are you ready? Are you ready? Are you ready? Okay. Yeah. No.
God, we thank you today for all the blessings you have given us. We trust that every good and perfect gift has come from your hand. We pray, God, now that with our hands, we would give with all that we have to honor and glorify your name. God, help us to use all the blessings you've given us to be a blessing to those around us. God, bless our tithes and our offerings today that they would be used for your kingdom and your glory. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.
As you are able, please remain standing for the reading of today's scripture lesson from the book of Galatians. You foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Before your very eyes, Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed as crucified. I would like to learn just one thing from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by believing what you heard? Are you so foolish after beginning by means of the Spirit? Are you now trying to finish by means of the flesh? Have you experienced so much in vain if it really was in vain? So again I ask, does God give you by his spirit and work miracles among you by the works of the law or by your believing what you heard? So also Abraham believed God and it was accredited to him as righteousness. Understand then that those who have faith are children of Abraham. Scripture foresaw that God would justify the Gentiles by faith and announce the gospel in advance to Abraham. All nations will be blessed through you. So those who rely on faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. For all who rely on the works of the law are under a curse. As it is written, cursed is everyone who does not continue to do everything written in the book of the law. Clearly no one who relies on the law is justified before God, because the righteous will live by faith. The law is not based on faith. On the contrary, it redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who is hung on a pole. He redeemed us in order that the blessing given to Abraham might come to the Gentiles through Christ Jesus, so that by faith we might receive the promise of the Spirit. So in Christ Jesus you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who are baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed, and heirs according to the promise. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. I have been blessed by seeing all the ways that our students are participating in worship this morning. So far, they've served as liturgists, they've rung bells, they're going to sing during communion. Libby, if you want to preach, to... No, okay. All right. We're so excited to have them leading us in worship today, though. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, right before worship, um, I had something happen to me that usually only happens in my nightmares. Um, I realized my microphone wasn't working and I couldn't get it to work. Um, you know, pastors have these kinds of nightmares, something not working, you can't find something, you're frantically running around, uh, you know, everybody's waiting for the service to start. It's kind of the college student equivalent of trying to find the right room for class. Uh, pastors have nightmares like that. So when I realized it wasn't working, I started to panic, and I was checking everything I could to try to get it to work. You know, step one, was the microphone turned on? Uh, check, it was. Second, did the microphone have batteries? Yes, it did. Was the microphone plugged into the transmitter? Yes, it was. And so I'd solved everything down here that I possibly could. So here I go running up the steps to the sound booth in my road to see what may be going on up there. Uh, you kind of maybe know where this story is going. I get to the top of the steps and realize that the receiver for the microphone, uh, the part that makes the whole thing work, was powered down. It was turned completely off. It wasn't working because the receiver didn't have power. And we've all been in this kind of situation before, right? After frantically working for hours to try to get something working, you finally figure out the batteries were dead, the cord was unplugged, the breaker was thrown. It's like that scene in National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation where after checking and double checking 25,000 imported Italian twinkle lights for the Christmas display, Ellen Griswold, the wife, realizes that the light switch in the garage had been off the whole time and it had to be turned on for the lights to work. You must have power. Well, this morning we want to look at how maybe we're guilty of making the exact same mistake in our quest for Christian unity. Maybe we're frantically running around, trying to figure out what the problem is, trying to figure out how to fix it, when the solution lies in making sure we are connected to the power source, realizing that without God's help, unity is impossible. 
Each week we've been inviting you to pray a prayer together with us that emphasizes this dependence upon God. It's under Saturday's reading, there in your GPS. And to kick us off this morning, I want to invite you to pray this together with me. Here in here again, the emphasis on relying on God's power, not our own. We pray this together. We ask you, O Lord, for the gifts of your Spirit. Enable us to penetrate the depth of the whole truth and grant that we may share with others the goods you have put at our disposal. Teach us to overcome divisions. Send us your Spirit to lead to full unity, your sons and daughters in full charity, in obedience to your will, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. You will also find there in your GPS the three main points of this morning's message. We invite you to follow along with us and fill in the blanks there. There are also daily scripture readings that will connect back to this theme of unity, and specifically this week, the idea that we are united as followers of Christ by water and the Spirit. Number one there in your GPS. We depend on the power of the Spirit to follow Jesus. We depend on the power of the Spirit. You'll remember that last week we introduced the fundamental question that the Apostle Paul is trying to answer in the book of Galatians. And the question is, do Christians have to observe the Jewish law and the Jewish traditions, things like circumcision and dietary laws, to be a part of God's people, or is faith in Jesus Christ enough? In other words, Paul is playing with this idea of are we saved by our works of obedience to the law or are we saved by grace through faith? Paul definitely chooses the latter option. He emphasizes that in the Christian journey it is all about grace from beginning to end and we cannot be saved by human effort. So starting in verse 1, he hits the Galatians with this series of questions to drive home his point. He says, You foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Before your very eyes, Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed as crucified. I would like to learn just one thing from you. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by believing what you heard? Are you so foolish? After beginning by means of the Spirit, are you now trying to finish by means of the flesh? Have you experienced so much in vain if it really was in vain? So again I ask, does God give you his spirit and work miracles among you by works of the law or by believing what you heard? You hear there over and over again the tension between works of the law and receiving the spirit by faith. Simply put, the Galatians were forgetting the very thing that we just prayed, that they were totally dependent on the power of the Spirit for all the things that Paul was trying to teach them. Now Paul, with his background of being a zealous Jew and a highly educated Pharisee, he, he really plays a, a strong card here. He uses the prime Old Testament example of Father Abraham. Uh, maybe you grew up in vacation Bible school singing the Father Abraham song. I see some of you wanting to do it right now. We'll resist, we'll resist that urge, Father Abraham and many sons, right? Many people, when they heard the word Abraham, would have automatically assumed that Abraham was considered righteous because he was circumcised. In other words, he was chosen by God because he observed the law. There was a very clear cause and effect there in their mind. Abraham did all these things, and then the effect was he was declared as righteous. However, Paul points out that the Scripture actually says that Abraham was righteous before God because of what he believed, not because of what he did. And he takes them all the way back to the beginning of the Bible, to the book of Genesis, and he's referring to Genesis chapter 15, verse 6. It's a very short verse. It simply says, Abram believed the Lord, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Now, the real kicker that Paul wants to emphasize here is that this was before the covenant of circumcision was even introduced. Right? If you're reading through the chronology there of Genesis, this is chapters before that covenant is even mentioned. So Paul's point is that this righteousness is about promise. It's about grace. It's about the power of the Holy Spirit, which is all received by faith, not by works. 
And Jesus emphasizes this kind of dependence in his own teaching. John chapter 15, verse 5. Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. But apart from me, you can do nothing. Maybe a good question to ask ourselves today is, where are the places in our lives where we're struggling with a mentality that says, sorry God, I've got this one, I'll do it all by myself. Maybe there are areas of your life where you're struggling with really trusting God with something. What are the ways maybe that you're trying to attain your goals through human effort instead of really placing your trust in God? I think even with regard to unity, Christian unity, we have to ask ourselves, how have we been guilty of trying to have Christian unity without dependence upon Christ? We depend on the power of the Holy Spirit to follow Jesus. That leads to number two there in your GPS. The second point is that the Spirit empowers our personal transformation. The Spirit empowers personal transformation. The first area of change that Paul focuses on here is for us as individuals. And he really wants to push this this belief that we are redeemed and made new through the power of the Spirit. So you look, for example, at verses 26 and 27. It says, So in Christ Jesus you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who are baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. Now, we can remember our Bible history a little bit here and remember that Paul probably writes about this so powerfully and so confidently because he had experienced this kind of individual transformation in his own life, right? He had been zealous for the law, zealous for the Jewish traditions, even to the point of persecuting the church. And yet we read this wonderful story in Acts chapter 9 about how Jesus miraculously appeared to Paul on the road to Damascus, and it changed his life forever. The very short summary of that story is kind of captured for us in Galatians 1, uh, the idea that the one who had once persecuted the church was now preaching the faith he had tried to destroy. Paul's transformation was miraculous, it was immediate, it was radical, so much so that still today we talk about folks having a Damascus Road type conversion experience. Now maybe you're sitting there thinking to yourself, well, not me. (laughs) I've never had that kind of Damascus Road, radical, miraculous conversion experience. Uh, Maybe you've never seen a blinding light. You've never heard the audible voice of Jesus. You've never experienced this kind of instantaneous transformation. Uh, Maybe you would say that instead of a microwavable kind of faith, your growth in grace feels more like a crock pot, right? Kind of turned to low. And it's been this slow, steady, baby steps of growth in grace along the way. Well, if that's how you feel, I want to reassure you this morning that we believe that God's grace is already at work in every life, whether that's slow, steady steps of growth or big, instantaneous, miraculous change. Both of them are valid expressions of God's grace, and we may experience both of those at different points in our lives. We also believe that our spiritual growth continues long after we are saved and that we continue to grow and mature as Christians. As I grew up hearing my mom say, as long as you are still breathing, God isn't finished with you yet. We continue to grow in grace. As United Methodists, we call this sanctifying grace, the work of grace that happens after conversion. And uh, Joe Iovino, Iovino, a Methodist writer, just explains this beautifully. He says, the word sanctify simply means to make holy but not in a holier-than-thou sort of way. Instead, God's sanctifying grace shapes us more and more into the likeness of Christ. As the Holy Spirit fills our lives with love for God and love for our neighbor, we begin to live differently. You know, one of my favorite passages of Scripture is 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. It says, If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone, and the new is here. Through the Holy Spirit, 
We believe that God transforms our lives. We can experience personal transformation. But that's not all. Number three there in your GPS. The Spirit also empowers our corporate transformation. This is one we don't talk about as much. The Spirit empowers our corporate transformation. You may remember those funny infomercials where maybe they had this amazing miracle product that seemed like it could do it all, right? Maybe you grew up like I did, watching the Home Shopping Network sometimes, and there would be some new gadget on there, and they were like, it slices, it dices, it chops, it makes, it'll do your taxes, it makes hundreds of julienne fries, right? It does all these different things. And then toward the end of their pitch, right, and I hear this in Billy May's voice, they would say, but wait, there's more, right? I love that, but wait, there's more moment. And at the end of our scripture reading today, Paul makes exactly that same kind of pitch. Paul wants us to pause, and he wants to say, but wait, there's more than just personal transformation. Verses 28 and 29, he talks about how we're changed as a community. He says, there is neither Jew nor Gentile. There is neither slave nor free, nor is there male or female. You are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. We aren't just changed individually. We are changed as a community. Our relationships are changed in how we relate to one another. You know, I believe that God has this amazing and beautiful way of bringing people together that you would never imagine being able to be in community together. God has this way of destroying barriers and breaking down walls, of creating peace and uniting people that you would never imagine. This is exactly what Paul experienced. It happened in, during his time in the relationship between Jews and Gentiles. Paul writes about this again in Ephesians 2. He says, Jesus is our peace. He has made two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility. By setting aside in this flesh the law with its commands and regulations, his purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace, and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross by which he put to death their hostility. I don't want to spell out this point completely for you. I'd actually like for you to use your imagination and think about where the walls are. Where are the barriers of hostility? Where are the divisions in the body of Christ? Where are the places that it would be most shocking for God to make one new people out of the two? You see, in Jesus Christ, we have inherited this amazing ministry of reconciliation because God is reconciling the whole world to himself in Christ. That leads us to our invitation today, though, and uh, I want to leave you with a word of warning uh, about exactly what this looks like. Uh, I have to tell you that throughout the entire narrative of Scripture, and personally in my own life, the Holy Spirit just has this way of surprising us, and maybe you've experienced this too. The Spirit has a way of stretching us and pushing us outside of our comfort zones, challenging us in unexpected ways. So I would just say to you, as we talk about following the leading of the Spirit, uh, just get ready and hang on for how the Spirit might lead you in your life. I brought a picture to explain this this morning. It's one of my favorite memes on the internet. Uh, when God says, I have plans for your life, what it feels like, uh, the Holy Spirit is the girl in the picture, if you can't read the labels there. And then the little boy holding on for dear life with clenched teeth and eyes wide, that's you. <laughs> and that's what it can sometimes feel like when you surrender your life to follow Jesus. Following the Spirit can often be scary, and it can be unexpected. However, I think something that helps us when we see a picture like this, and it's what Paul teaches us, is that even as we face the unexpected, even as we face anxious times in the life of the church, we trust in God's goodness. We trust in God's grace. We trust in God's abiding presence 
in our lives. That we may find ourselves in new territory as a church, but we believe that we are held in the hands of the one who loves us and calls us by name, claims us as his own, and cares for us the most. We are united by water and the Spirit. Let's pray together this morning as we prepare our hearts to celebrate Holy Communion. God, we thank you for the work of your grace, not just in our individual lives, but in our lives together as a community. God, so many times we talk about how you're able to do immeasurably more than all we could ever ask or imagine in our individual lives. But God, help us to believe that for our relationships. Help us to believe that for our church. Help us to believe that for our community. We pray that the work of your grace would spill out in, in unexpected and surprising ways, that it would overflow in and through our lives and in our, through our community to unite us in ways that just shock us. Bring us together, Lord, by your Spirit. God, as we come to the table today, we pray that through this holy habit, you will continue to nourish us by your grace and give us all we need as we seek to follow you. We pray all this in Christ's name, and all God's people said, Amen. On the night that he was betrayed, Jesus shared one last meal with his disciples. While they were gathered, he took the bread... He gave thanks for it and broke it. He gave it to his disciples and said, This is my body which is given for you. Take and eat. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper was finished, he took the cup. He gave thanks for it and gave it to his disciples and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let's pray together. God, as we come to your table over and over and over again, we humbly realize that over and over and over again, we are desperately in need of your grace. We are desperately in need of a fresh outpouring of your spirit. We are in need of being reminded that you are with us always, even to the very end of the age. Lord, we ask that you would pour out your Spirit upon this bread and cup, that they will be for us the body and blood of Christ. But also pour out your Spirit upon us, that we might be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world, until Christ comes in final victory, and we feast at his heavenly banquet. We pray all this in Christ's name. Amen. We want to invite our communion servers to come forward, and we will serve them first so that they can serve you. They will kneel here, uh, and we will let them go first. Uh, we want to remind you as they are coming that this is uh, God's table, and everyone's welcome to come who would like to respond to the invitation this morning. We also want to remind you that if you need to be served in your seat at the end, if you will raise your hand, we will bring the elements to you. And last but not least, if you need a gluten-free wafer as you come to the rail, just hold up your hand and we will bring that to you as well. But let's celebrate God's love together in Holy Communion today.
If those of you in the balcony in the back of the sanctuary would lead us, let's celebrate God's love together in Holy Communion. If anyone needs to be served in their seat, if you would just raise your hand. If you would, as you're able, stand together with us and let's sing our closing hymn together.
Amen. Thank you so much for joining us in worship this morning. Remember, if you're a guest with us, I already see Miss Brenda's back there ready to mug you, but don't worry, it's just a coffee mug. Uh, filled with coffee. We would love to thank you for being with us. Uh, also, I saw just a couple yawns during the last hymn. If you need a second cup of coffee, join us in our cafe uh, just out the back sanctuary doors and loop your way around the building. Uh, follow your nose back there. We'd love to have you join us for a time of fellowship. As you go, would you receive this benediction? May you go forth today as the people of God, empowered by the Spirit of God. Go to the world in peace in love, in strength, and in joy. We pray this in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. God bless you. Have a great Sunday.